Hey. Hello, everyone. Does anybody know where uh, Robert Butnick is? This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon! It's the cat's meow. By 1989, the need to sell cable subscribers on Nick at Night was greatly diminishing. Originally, when Nickelodeon premiered in 1979, it was set up so that the daytime programming for children was available on a basic cable subscription, while the evening and early morning hours were given to a separate channel that could be accessed through a premium subscription. For Warner Communications, this second channel was originally Star Channel, which would later become the Movie Channel, and then Arts, which would later become A&E. But that was just what Warner was providing. As Nickelodeon spread out into different cable packages across the country, those services didn't necessarily pick up the evening hour channels and instead replaced them with something else from another company. In one instance, Nickelodeon would switch over to the Playboy channel, which I can imagine was a wild ride for the parents watching. In 1985, we saw the introduction of Nick at Night, a home for classic television from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, nostalgic shows for the baby boomer parents who actually paid for the cable subscriptions. On paper, Nick at Night was still a separate channel from daytime Nickelodeon, and as such, those smaller cable providers still had no obligation to air it over what they were already airing during those hours. The best way to get cable providers to change their minds was to convince audiences watching daytime Nickelodeon that Nick at Night was something worth having. And the main way Nickelodeon did that was by finding classic shows and airing them on daytime Nick as a sort of teaser of what the grown-ups were missing. This became something of a yearly tradition for Nick. In 1985, their sample show was Dennis the Menace. 1986, it was The Monkees. 1987, The Bad News Bears and in 1988, Lancelot Link, Secret Chimp, with a bit of Looney Tunes as a treat. This seemed to work. Combined with Nickelodeon's overall success post Double Dare, the instances of Nick and Knight being replaced by the cable provider dropped pr pretty much zero by 1989. But despite that being the case, this new tradition of yearly Nickelodeon, Nick at Night crossover shows would continue for a while. So what show did they pick for 1989? It needed to be something that our modern children audiences would latch onto, so preferably a show with a young star with plots about youthful topics. It has to be a comedy, so probably a sitcom, and it has to have been popular enough in its day so that mom and dad want to sit down with their kids and watch it with them. That way, mom and dad will see the commercial for Solo Flex and go, oh, I could use that. So beginning on November 6th, 1989 at 3.30 p.m. between episodes of Heathcliff and You Can't Do That on Television, a new generation was introduced to the Patty Duke Show. Nickelodeon gives you Patty Duke asking the musical question... Tell me, Mama, what to do If a boy makes eyes at you Tell me, Mama, what to say When he looks at me that way Should I let him hold my hand Tell him that I think he's grand Tell me, Mama Tell me, Mama Tell me what to do the Patty Duke Show starring Patty Duke, weekdays on Nickelodeon. Actually, those kids might already know it if they stayed up late, as the Patty Duke Show had been airing on Nick at Night for over a year at this point, since September of 1988. But Nick Knacks is about daytime Nickelodeon, so we're talking about it now. Patty Duke plays the dual roles of Patty and Kathy Lane, two cousins identical in appearance but polar opposites in personality. Patty is your typical modern American teen girl, far less concerned about her high school studies and more focused on parties, trying to convince her parents to let her have a telephone in her room, and her relationship with her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Richard, played by Eddie Applegate, who's hunky but a bit empty-headed. Patty, how would you like to serve on a committee to help stop school dropouts? Uh, 
Gee, Papa, I'm afraid you picked a bad time to ask me. Why? Because I'm dropping out of school next week. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Kathy is soft-spoken, responsible, and academically minded. She's traveled all over the world with her father, who's a newspaper foreign correspondent. But when he's not able to take her anymore, Kathy moves to New York City to stay with her uncle Martin, played by William Shallert, Aunt Natalie, Jean Byron, and little cousin Ross, Paul O'Keefe. And of course, her cousin, Patty. Oh, but I couldn't run against Patty. The girls league needs someone who's popular. What they call a wheel. I withdraw. Oh no, you'd make a better president than I would. They need someone with culture. You've lived all over Europe, you speak French. I withdraw. Well, just a minute. If you've both been accepted as nominees, neither one of you can withdraw. What's going to stop us? What do you think would happen to our whole political system if a nominee withdrew just because he liked his opponent? You see, you could undermine the whole structure of our country. Despite their mismatched behaviors, Patty and Kathy are the best of friends, confiding in each other and helping each other through thick and thin, even if the thick and thin was usually caused by Patty. Kathy makes a new dress for herself, Patty thinks the design would become a big hit, and before you know it, the teens are running a sweatshop out of their bedroom. Here's some W-4 forms for withholding taxes, unemployment and disability forms for your employees. You'll have 48 hours in which to get a manufacturer's license. You'll need a safety inspector seal for the premises and a waiver to rezone this house for manufacturing. <laughs> there hasn't been a residential manufacturer waiver in the last 50 years. <laughs> Can they do this to us? What are you going to do? Fight free enterprise? <laughs> or there was that time that, because they look the same, Kathy was accidentally given the flu shot that was meant for Patty. Kathy feels ill and has to skip out on a dance party with her boyfriend Ted. Fearing that this will ruin Kathy and Ted's relationship, Patty pretends to be Kathy and has to bounce back and forth between the two identities. <laughs> You'd think this twin switcheroo thing would show up a lot on this show, but the we're identical and that confuses people gags are far fewer than you'd expect. There's maybe 10 episodes out of 104 where it even comes up as a minor plot point. Much more common are Patty's get quick rich schemes, like starting a babysitting company without any staff, or writing a book and getting tricked by a vanity publisher run by Harry Mudd from Star Trek. So if you want to talk to anybody, you can talk to my lawyer. Good night, Mr. Lane. Young lady. Miss Blair, be sure to tell your lawyer that the girl who signed the contract is 16 years old. What did you say? <laughs> and there's plenty of episodes with Patty dealing with boy trouble, including the very first episode where Patty falls in love with her French teacher. Instead of having a proper conversation with Patty to let her down, the teacher instead decides to take Patty out on an intentionally bad date to cool her off, which, you know, not a good idea. There's a few episodes about Patty's relationships with her little brother, a few episodes about dad mishearing something and assuming the worst, like confusing a surprise vacation with Patty eloping with Roger. There's the prerequisite holiday episodes, including a Christmas New Year's two-parter where Kathy's father, also played by Shallert, gets fired, complete with a fourth wall breaking cliffhanger. You can't fire him, it's Christmas. So it is. Merry Christmas, everybody. Did you hear that? That's terrible. Imagine firing someone on Christmas. He wouldn't do that. Or would he? Is J.R. Castle going to turn out to be the rat of the Western world? Tune in next week and we'll all find out. Bye. Merry Christmas, everybody. Frankly, it's a very normal and unremarkable mid-20th century sitcom. The usual types of stories seen in dozens of shows throughout the 50s, just with the weird dual role from the star. That one weird element was key though, because by the time the Patty Duke show premiered on ABC in September of 1963, the nuclear family sitcom had reached a high saturation point. Comedies about domestic life were the default throughout the 1950s. 
with the stay-at-home mother, the pipe-smoking father, and the 2.5 kids getting into some kind of wholesome trouble. The only significant choice to make in these shows was who was the main character. Was it the mother, like in the Donna Reed show? Was it the father, like Father Knows Best? Or was it the kids, like Leave It to Beaver? This lack of variety wasn't going to fly anymore come the 1960s. If you wanted to keep doing the domestic sitcom, you had to find a twist. Domestic sitcom, but they're hillbillies who struck it rich. Domestic sitcom, but the wife is a witch. Domestic sitcom, but they're spooky. Domestic sitcom, but they're spooky. Domestic sitcom, but the kid role is taken up by a obnoxious talking horse. You get the idea. And so the Patty Do show tried to stand out by being the domestic sitcom with the weird identical cousins gimmick. But that wasn't the pitch. That came a little bit later in development. All ABC wanted was a show starring who they were predicting would be the next big teen star, the next it girl, Patty Duke. Born Anna Marie Duke on December 14th, 1946, Patty Duke's childhood was rough, to put it lightly. An alcoholic father, a mother with clinical depression, and when she was eight, legal guardianship was given to talent coaches John and Ethel Ross. With them, Duke's name was changed to Patty in an attempt to take advantage of the popularity of actress Patty McCormick. The Rosses were terrible, exploitive and controlling, forcing Duke to lie about her age and credentials, and even denying her medical care if it would hurt her image. I broke my arm while I was roller skating. Both my mother and I were terrified to tell the Rosses that this had happened. It turned out to be a hairline fracture going straight up the arm which wasn't really noticeable, but meant I couldn't hold anything. And if someone touched me, it hurt a lot. The Rosses decided, however, that nothing would go on my arm. No cast or splint or wrapping, because I might lose the job. Duke ended up cast in a number of commercials, a small role in a soap opera, and was a winning contestant on the $64,000 question, which ended up being one of the big quiz shows investigated for fraud accused of giving contestants answers in advance. In 1962, Duke was made to testify to a congressional investigatory board, and midway through broke into tears, admitting that she had been coached to lie to them. Duke's big break came in 1959, when she was cast as Helen Keller in the Broadway production of The Miracle Worker. The show was a smash success, winning the Tony Award for Best Play in 1960, and Duke went from an obscure child actor to a top-billed star pretty much overnight. The play was adapted to a film in 1962, with Duke reprising her role, and once again, it was a huge critical success. Patty Duke was the talk of the town, and at the 35th Academy Awards, she would win the Best Supporting Actress Oscar. At the age of 16, she became the youngest competitive Oscar winner, a record she'd hold for a decade until 10-year-old Tatum O'Neill won for Paper Moon. Naturally, this caught the attention of pretty much everyone in show business, not the least of which was film and television producer United Artists. In a deal with ABC, United Artists announced the development of The Patty Duke Show in May of 1962. The only problem was, nobody had any idea what the show was going to be about. ABC wanted to do a series with me, even though no one at the network had the slightest idea what it ought to be about. The Rosses didn't have a concept either, but they were taken with the idea of me becoming the youngest person in television history to have a primetime series named after her. The only person who wasn't excited, as well as the only person who wasn't given any choice, was me. To develop the concept, Sidney Sheldon was brought in. An Oscar-winning director and producer from Film and the Stage, Sheldon hadn't worked in television before. In order to get to know her and determine her strength as a performer, the Rosses sent Duke to stay with Sheldon at his home in Los Angeles for a length of time. There, Sheldon noticed that Duke seemed to have two distinct personalities, one perky and a bit wild, and the other calm and collected and professional. What nobody knew at the time was that Patty Duke was bipolar, something she wouldn't get diagnosed as until 1982. It was from this interaction that Sheldon conceived of the idea of Patty Duke playing two distinct characters. The original pitch had her as identical twins, but at some point, this became identical cousins. My idea was twins. Bill Asher, who directed it, said, let's make them cousins. So I said, okay. And I, I think he put his name on as a creator because he thought of cousins instead of twins. So his name is on. The, I wrote the show, and the idea was mine. Actually, it was the Patty role, for which I did no research, that proved to be more difficult for me. As glib as I was for a person my age, I was really not that outgoing, and certainly not about teenage pursuits. 
I didn't know how 16-year-olds danced. How could I know? I never went to a dance. I listened to rock music only when I visited my mother. With the Rosses, it was almost never allowed. I wasn't a teenager of my era. So with a concept in hand, a pilot was filmed, most of which would be re-edited into a season one episode. Early on, to pull off the scenes of Patty and Kathy together, experiments were done with traveling mats, early compositing techniques. For the series proper, the show stuck to body doubles and split screens. Very good body doubles and split screens with some very clean splicing. Duke would perform on one side, then on the other side she would perform against an audio recording of her first performance. Hello, Patty. Oh, hi, Kat. How was school? Cuckoo. They put me in an almond factory. You want a flipper? <laughs> they were playing chess without a chessboard. Did they use queen's pawn to queen four opening? And retaliate with king's rook pawn to rook four? You're as way out as they are. If you go up to your room, you'll find a surprise there. Cuckoo. <laughs> While Duke got along very well with the cast and crew, even here there was a level of exploitation. The show was shot in New York City instead of Los Angeles for one reason. Child labor laws. As Duke was still a minor, she would only be able to work five hours a day by California law. Which is not nearly enough, especially when you're playing two characters. But New York law, well... You can make a 16-year-old Patty Duke work 12-hour days, from 7 in the morning to 7 at night. The show's very concept was just unsustainable. All the while, the Rosses still controlled the ins and outs of Duke's daily life. They worked her from 7 to 7, 12 hours a day. Uh, and then she would go home and the, the Rosses, who were her legal guardians now, kind of, or at least the ones who were in charge of her, they, they were her managers, and her mother was in an institution, I think, part-time anyway. And uh, so they would to make sure she didn't get a swelled head, they would have her do the dishes. Being the new It Girl, of course, meant doing a lot more than just the show. There was the usual parade of interviews and photo shoots. Patty and Kathy appeared in commercials for shampoo and hairspray. Breck shampoo. You know... It's the only leading shampoo that doesn't have a synthetic detergent base. And of course, the higher-ups had to see if they could make a pop star out of Duke. Multiple episodes of the show featured Patty and or Kathy performing music for various talent shows or gatherings. In 1965, Patty Duke released her first album, Don't Just Stand There, which had two Billboard Top 40 hits with its title track and the song Say Something Funny. Further albums failed to take off, however. It was, overall, a very exhausting and unhealthy time for Duke. As the years of the Patty Duke show went on, I was in a constant haze of anger and depression, the same kind that I'd witnessed in my mother. I went and did my job, but I felt lonely and hopeless. If you're covering up, one layer won't do it after a while. More and more layers are needed, and that's very wearing. However, the Patty Duke show ultimately provided Duke the opportunity to escape control from the Rosses when she began a romantic relationship with one of the show's directors, Harry Falk Jr. The Rosses were so upset by this development that they tried to move the show to Los Angeles to separate them, but Duke and Falk would end up marrying in 1965. The Rosses were successfully banned from the set of the show, and for the first time, Duke had just a little bit of control over her own life. Unfortunately, it wasn't a great marriage. Falk was 13 years Duke's senior, and Duke was still dealing with a lot of mental illness and substance abuse. The two would divorce in 1967. Premiering on September 18th, 1962, The Patty Duke Show was moderately successful in its first two seasons, in part because of competition. This was still the three networks era of television, with ABC only directly competing with NBC and CBS. On NBC, you had The Virginian, a western that was quite popular, but on CBS you had a news documentary show called CBS Reports, sort of a predecessor to 60 Minutes. It was not a major competitor for the time slot, so the Patty Duke show could hold a steady second place overall and be the bigger hit with younger audiences. 
That is, until world news got much more interesting. But toward the end of the second year, the, the CBS reports did a, a piece about the Kennedys after the assassination. And that night, our audience went in the toilet. And I said, ah, there's a harbinger for you. I don't see that we're going to, we don't have legs at all, I don't think. And the next year, they put Lost in Space on. And bye-bye. <laughs> So with ratings dropping, disagreement over if the show would switch to color, Patty Duke not turning out to be the big teen superstar the producers were hoping for, and the fact that Duke was entering adulthood and aging out of the show's demographic, the Patty Duke show ended after its third season, airing its last new episode on April 27, 1966. With 104 episodes under its belt, it became a syndication mainstay for the years to follow, reruns going well into the 1970s. So, was the Patty Duke show good? Uh, not really. It was hardly terrible, but it was very much a generic 1950s sitcom made in the 1960s. The identical cousin gimmick served as nothing but a technical gimmick, a flex of having Patty Duke on the screen twice. Very few scripts actually took advantage of this, and by season 3, there were whole episodes where Kathy didn't even show up. Get rid of the split screen and there's nothing else here to really hold the show together, nothing to make it stand out. Patty Duke was talented. Her dual performance here was a great profile of her acting chops, and she clearly had great comedic timing. The rest of the cast is solid as well, but the scripts are just tired, the characters are stock, and the filming is flat. Binging the show for knickknacks is the most bored I've been in a while. Which makes Patty Duke's personal story all the worse. The greatest TV show in the world wouldn't be worth the emotional abuse Duke suffered, and the fact that she dealt with all of that shit for something so mediocre is maddening. The rest of Patty Duke's life is beyond the scope of this video, with multiple high-profile relationships and marriages and dealing with mental illness, but things improved for her considerably into the 1970s and 1980s. In 1987, Duke published her autobiography, Call Me Anna, which brought to light her struggles around the Patty Duke show's production and her relationship with the Rosses. So this was all public record when Nickelodeon picked it up to show on Nick at Night. And while I'm not remotely saying that the behind the scenes stuff should have banished the Patty Duke show into oblivion, it does become clear that Nick really wasn't concerned with this aspect when picking shows to air. This was within a few years of Jay North revealing the abuse he faced while doing Dennis the Menace, and Nick saw no issue continuing to run Dennis the Menace up through 1994. As far as they were concerned, baby boomer nostalgia trumped whether or not a show was made at the expense of a child's well-being. As for its daytime Nickelodeon run, yes, the Patty Doo show was about young people, but it was about young people in the early 1960s, and while some issues are timeless, relationships, schoolwork, trying to figure out what you want to be when you grow up, the style and vernacular of its teens were probably much too dated for a young audience in 1989. Ultimately, the Patty Duke show's impact on daytime Nickelodeon was minimal. It was only on there for five months, airing its last on February 25, 1990. It remained on Nick and Night for much longer, all the way to August 31st, 1993. It was a much better fit up there anyway. While the Patty Duke show represented a terrible time in her life, Duke still had a great relationship with the cast and crew, they were never the problem, it was the producers and the talent agents. And as time moved on, Duke found herself willing to return to the franchise in various ways. In 1999, ABC aired a Patty Duke Show reunion movie, with the entire cast returning. It's the Patty Duke Show reunion movie. Remember that show about those twins? Two teenage girls shenanigans. Now she and she will reunite. It's The Patty Duke Show Reunion Movie, CBS Next. When cousins are two of a kind. In 2009, everyone reunited once again, minus the late Gene Byron, for a series of PSAs promoting online application for Social Security. Kath, have you heard from Patty and Richard yet? Yes. Patty was going to stop and pick up a pie, and Richard was going to file for Medicare. 
filing for Medicare? <laughs> we won't eat till midnight tomorrow. <laughs> Richard's filing for Medicare online at SocialSecurity.gov. It takes less than 10 minutes. 10 minutes? I had to go to the office and wait. Online. What about the paperwork? Online. Uh, but Richard's still working. Online. Hey. You made it. No problem, Papo. I got the pie. And I got my Medicare. And I've got the turkey. You get that online, too? And finally, when reruns of the Patty Duke show were brought to MeTV in 2015, Patty Duke and William Shallert promoted the show in character. Cousin. Patty? I'm Kathy. They laugh alike. They walk alike at times. Kathy? I'm Patty. You can lose your mom. I give up. Watch us on MeTV. Weekdays at 6, 5 central on MeTV. William Shallert would pass away the next year. And sadly, so would Patty Duke. Passing away on March 29th, 2016, at the age of 69. If you want to check out The Patty Duke Show for yourself, all three seasons are available on DVD. And at the time of this writing, it's available on a number of free streaming services such as Tubi, Pluto TV, and the Roku channel. It's a cheap show to syndicate, and it's also a show that copyright bots don't seem to care too much about, because the entire thing has also been unofficially uploaded to YouTube. I'm much more likely to get dinged for using the theme song than any of this footage. Should you watch The Patty Duke Show? Honestly, even if you ignore the abuse Patty Duke faced while making the show, and you shouldn't ignore it, but if you do, it's so hard to recommend. You can find these same plots and characters in a dozen other classic sitcoms, many of them with sharper delivery and more inventive filming. If you're like Tobey Maguire's character in Pleasantville and are just looking to escape into a black and white domestic sitcom, there are better options out there. Watch My Three Sons. My Three Sons was good. As for Nickelodeon, the Patty Duke show's brief and unsuccessful daytime run would not deter them from continuing these Nick and Night samplers. And we'll be seeing more of them for a few more years yet. Hopefully the next one will have a nicer behind the scenes story. Nick 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 Nickelodeon Nick 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 Nickelodeon Next time, we check in with Nick Jr. and their newest Canadian acquisition. Fred Penner is better than Raffi, don't at me. Today's research shout-out goes to Call Me Anna, the autobiography of Patty Duke. There was a lot of Patty Duke's life that I didn't touch on here. The backlash against her being in Valley of the Dolls, her marriage to Gomez Adams, the fact that her son is Goonie and Hobbit Sean Astin. She had a difficult but fascinating life, and her autobiography reads like an exorcism, worth a read for its own sake. Thank you all for watching. If you like support knickknacks and other pop arena projects, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to research materials, production values, and vitamin D. I don't go outside enough. You can also support the channel by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing, hitting that bell icon for notifications, and following me on Twitter, sending a one-time donation through PayPal or Coffee, and sharing knickknacks with all your friends. I'll catch you next time, and remember, Black Lives Matter.